In this week's practical, then, we'll be covering multiple regression. Last week, we covered simple regression, and then what we'll do this week is just extend this to when we've got more than one predictor variable. So the numbers we'll be dealing with today are the same as we were using in simple regression. So if you wanted to go back over simple regression to remind yourself, you can do. But the things that we'll pick at the table are exactly the same, except that we're just dealing with more than one predictor. So what I'll do is uh, return to the data set that we used last week. So this was data looking at whether uh, someone's annual salary or pay is related to their productivity, and also whether the number of holidays they take was also related to productivity. And I've added a third variable in for this week. So imagine the researchers also took another measure, and this time they measured the amount of free cake that was given out at work to see whether this would also have an effect on their productivity. And in a multiple regression, what we can do is look at the combined effects of these variables on productivity and then isolate the individual effects as well. So it's a really useful, powerful technique to really explore the data and further detail rather than just running a load of correlations, which can get a bit messy and there's good statistical reasons not to do that. The multiple regression just provides you with a nice, fairly straightforward summary of the data. And we'll start off by performing what's known as a forced entry regression, or it's just simply called enter in SPSS. And this type of regression is when you just throw all the variables in in one go. It doesn't matter which order you put them in, and then the total model is calculated, and then you can look at also the individual effects. So we'll do that now. So if you go up to Analyze, and then down to Regression, and then down to Linear Regression, then we get our Linear Regression box. We're looking at productivity for the dependent variable. So this is our outcome. Do our predictor variables predict this outcome? And then, as I say, it doesn't matter what order you put these in. You just want to put all of the variables in. And then what you can do is click on the statistics box. And we just want to select a few other options that it doesn't give us by default. So you can click on collinearity diagnostics. And We'll just leave it at there for that point. We'll come back to R squared change in a minute. Click on continue. What you can also do is select the plots option. And what you can do with this is if you put Z predicted in the X axis, Z residual in the Y axis, this will give you a plot which plots the predicted values against the residual values. So the predicted values would be whatever your model's predicting, and the residual values will be whatever the data looks like in terms of how it deviates from the model. So we know that all the values are not going to fit, say, the regression line. The residual values just gives you an idea of how far the data points are from the predicted values. So you can click on OK then. And then we can run that linear regression now. And then once we get the SPSS output up, we start going through now what we've got here. So the first thing to look at in this model summary table is just below this, you can just see that it's recorded what predictor variables you've entered and then what dependent or outcome variable you've entered. So you can just double check that you've put the right variables in the right boxes. And then we can work through the tables then. So the R square value, second box here, this is similar to what we had last week, but this time, this is the R square or the proportion of variance in the dependent variable, which is explained by the whole model. So it's the combination of predictor variables that are important here. And it's the, co it's the proportion of variance in productivity, which is explained by all three predictor variables. <coughs> 
So we have an R square of 0 0.374, which means that just over 37% of the variance in productivity scores were accounted for by our three predictor variables. Then in the second table, you can have a look at the ANOVA table then, and this gives you, this tells you whether this model is a significant improvement on a baseline model. The baseline model you can think of as the model we would have if we just assumed that there was no relationship between the predictor variables and the outcome variable. So in a regression line, that would just be a flat line indicating no different, no association between these variables. And then this ANOVA just tells us whether there's a significant improvement once we add the regression line, or in multiple regression, it's more of a regression plane. Once we've added this model to the data, is there a significant improvement in the model fit? So for this example, there is a significant improvement because the p-value is less than 0 0.001. So in other words, we can assume that this is a significant model of productivity. We can then go on to the coefficients table and have a look at this. So in a simple regression, we just had one variable in this table. In multiple regression, we've got all the variables. And what we can do with this table is compare the relative importance of each of these variables in the model. So does one predict productivity better than the others? One thing we'll start off with is just looking at the unstandardized coefficients. You can look at the constant here, and this, in a simple regression, is the point at which the regression line crosses the y-axis, or the point at which you start drawing that line. In a multiple regression, we kind of have to start thinking multidimensionally now. Um, and imagine it more of a regression plane than a regression line. But it still just cuts the y-axis at one particular point on that axis. In this case, 4.58. And this corresponds to this bit of the regression formula, which is just the B0 coefficient for the constant. You can then go on to the next line, which is the unstandardized coefficient for holidays. Then this would be your B1 in the regression equation here, and this is just the rate at which one unit change in holidays would predict the unit change in productivity. So for each unit change in holidays, we'd expect productivity to rise by 0.008. And then the same for cake, and you'll notice the only difference between this and a simple regression now is we've got multiple coefficients for the variables. So we've got a coefficient representing each of the variables in the equation. And it's the combination of these coefficients which calculates the predicted value of y, or the predicted value of productivity. Then the final one, and you could have as many as these theoretically as you wanted in a multiple regression. So then we've got pay, which was a B coefficient here, and that would be B3, say, in an equation. Now, one thing you might notice about this coefficient is it's written slightly odd. It's got 4.881E-5. Now, this is because the coefficient for this variable pay was actually really low, and it was so low that SPSS can't fit it into this table with the correct number of decimal places. So the value for this was actually, I've calculated it here, 0 0.00004881. This E5 is an indication of this is the, um, this is just taken, you move the decimal point five places to the left, basically. But essentially the point of this is it's a very low number. And there is a reason, good reason for this. If you remember pay that we had in the SPSS file, pay was measured in terms of the annual salary. So the scale of measurement was huge. Some people were earning up to 60,000 pounds. So this coefficient here tells you the amount of change in productivity for each unit change in pay. So in other words, if pay rises by one pound, how much does productivity change? 
And because pay is measured in those units, a rise of one pound in pay is really not going to make you know, any difference to productivity. So in order to look at that, you'd need to look at, you know, for a rise of a thousand pounds, does it have an effect? So the point here is that these unstandardized coefficients are used for the calculation, but when it comes to comparing variables, it, they're very of limited use really, because you can't really compare these meaningfully because they're all in completely different units of measurement. So that's why we usually, for interpretation, we use the standardized coefficient here. And this is just the coefficient which has been standardized so that each variable is based on the same units of measurement. So we can now meaningfully compare these variables. We can see that holidays had a beta coefficient of 0 0.03, whereas cake had a beta coefficient of much higher, 0.499, which tells us that cake was, or the amount of cake given out, was a much better predictor of productivity than the amount of holidays taken. And for pay, we've got a beta coefficient of 0.32, which tells us that pay was also a pretty good predictor in the model of productivity, but slightly less than cake. Now, what we can also do is we've got a measure of how much that var each variable contributes to the model there. And we can look at whether each variable is significant. So is each variable making a significant contribution or prediction to this model. So for holidays, we can see the p-value was 0.891, so it was not significant. For cake, the p-value was 0.032, so that was significant. And for pay, we've got a p-value of 0.012, which again was significant. One other thing that we'll just look at as well is these collinearity statistics. So we clicked on the box of collinearity diagnostics to get these up, and we can just use these to determine whether we've got a likely problem with multicollinearity or not. So what happens in a regression is if your variables are highly correlated, or if the predictor variables are highly correlated with each other, then this can cause a problem in the model fit. So if the correlations are above around about 0.9, then this indicates that you've got a potential problem with uh, multicollinearity. But we can use these collinearity statistics to just check whether this is likely to be a problem for this regression. We'll focus on the VIF statistic rather than the tolerance statistic. You can use either. Uh, they both tell you the same thing because the tolerance statistic is just the inverse of the VIF statistic. And what we're looking at for what we're looking for here is a VIF statistic of below 10. So if we've got a VIF statistic here of 3.32, then this indicates that we're unlikely to have a problem with multicollinearity. So we can not worry about that for this data. If the VIF statistic was above 10 or approaching 10, then what you'd want to do is just have a look at your variables just to see if you need to include all the variables that you've included, whether they all need to go into the model. Because when you've got very high correlations between, say, two predictor variables, it suggests that they're almost measuring the same thing. So you might want to have a look at whether it's actually important or useful to have both of those variables in, or whether you could take one out and simplify the regression model. We also selected the plot to give us the, uh, to plot the predicted values against the residual values. And this is what the plot will look like in the top left hand box if we've met the assumptions of homoscedasticity and linearity. What you're looking for is basically a random array of dots. So if you've got something like this here, where there's no obvious pattern to these dots, they're pretty randomly scattered, then this suggests that the assumptions have been met. When you've 
got some kind of pattern going on in the data. So for this example here, this is heteroscedasticity. When you have got this kind of pattern, then this indicates that the assumptions might have been violated. So what's happened here for heteroscedasticity is that across values of the predicted of the cross values of the predicted values here, the variability or the variance changes in the residual values here. So it starts off as very narrow and ends up as very large. So when you've got a pattern like this, it suggests that it's violating the assumption of homoscedasticity and that your model might not be suitable it might not be suitable to do a regression, a linear regression model on this data. And then if you've got patterns in this box here, such as this, this starts suggesting that your the relationship between the predicted values and the residual values is non-linear. And again, this is a big problem if you want to do a linear regression, because as the name suggests, it's assuming linear relationships between the variables. So when you've got any kind of pattern like this, then you need to be wary of using a multiple regression on the data. But usually, you'll end up, hopefully, with something like this. So for the data set that I had to look at, the data points are spread out like this. And there's no, there's a slight bunch up of data here. And there's then there's odd outliers here. But other than that, there's no obvious pattern to this data is fairly randomly distributed. So for this data, we can assume that we've met the assumptions of homoscedasticity and linearity. 